creative portability, a new chance. Some of you might say, is this a kind of second chance? Was there a first one? Did we miss something? Or are we still at the beginning concerning portability and mobility of data, personal and non-personal? Yes, that's uh, the topic of this uh, panel. Oh, we have to, we have to do the, the booster. And, um, oh, we have 25 minutes, that's good. And uh, we will uh, see how far we can get. There are many issues uh, to be covered. Um, I'm very happy um, being able to moderate this, um, representing the Foundation for Data Protection in Germany. I'm happy about the two experts I have um, at my sides, uh, uh, Cecilia, Alvarez uh, Regorias from Facebook and Marie Therese Edmeyer from the European Commission. Uh, she represents the Director General Connect of the EC. She leads the policy team dealing with non personal data and its free flow. And mainly she is involved in cloud policy. And um, Cecilia is the European Middle East Asia Privacy Policy Manager at Facebook. And before that, she was DPO at Pfizer, and she joins several a number of organizations dealing with IT law and data protection. And uh, so you see, we have a kind of a problem with this panel because we are three lawyers by profession, so uh, we are a bit biased legally. So if we might uh, get some indistinct at some point, you might intervene if you have technical background and please correct us if, if, we, if we do so. Um, before uh, I and later perhaps if we have uh, time left, you um, enter with some questions to our experts. I would um, like uh, them to um, give us an idea of their um, respective approach concerning data portability and what, what are we talking about. Marie Therese, please give an insight of your view. Uh, thank you and good morning from my side. Data portability, I think uh, for me it's a chance, it's an empowerment for the data subject and in particular it's a new tool which can increase competition. Um, you have in the data portability rules in the GDPR which are addressing the relation between the data subject and the data controller. Um, however, I would also like to highlight that you have other EU rules on data portability related to non-personal data, which are uh, stipulated or grounded on the uh, new regulation um, on the free flow of non-personal data, which became applicable in May this year. And here, uh, so this regulation you might be aware of it or not, but it's uh, complementing the GDPR, so it's uh, uh, addressing the free flow of non-personal data in the EU, and it uh, basically um, prohibits any data localization requirement um, at national level, except for uh, one exception, which is public security, but that means that uh, you can process, use, store your data, your non-personal data, uh, anywhere in the EU. And uh, this regulation is also addressing data portability rules uh, in the relation between the data controller and so the B2B relation, to be not too technical or legal, so the B2B um, um, rules between data controller and uh, data processor and not the data subject. But uh, this is very important because um, when we uh, drafted uh, the proposal for the free flow of non-personal data regulation, um, we identified uh, vendor login as a key obstacle to data movement within the EU. So 70% uh, uh, of the um, participants of, a of SMEs, uh, which were um, asked uh, questions, uh, identified that they would like to switch cloud providers, um, but uh, more than uh, almost 60% of them had problems when switching. So we identified vendor login, meaning that you cannot move your data, you, you, you have to stay in a contractual relationship usually with a provider um, as a key obstacle to the free movement of data and as a hindrance for market competition. And uh, perhaps as a last sentence of what the Commission is doing in this regard, uh, I would like uh, to mention that the Commission has uh, adopted guidance on uh, four SMEs uh, on how to handle mixed data sets, so data sets comprised of personal and non-personal data. 
and uh, it's addressing also uh, data portability. It facilitates a process, a self-regulatory process, where um, working groups are uh, have uh, are drafting codes of conduct for porting data and for switching providers, cloud providers, which will be developed by November this year and uh, implemented um, by uh, May next year. So uh, we have other code of conduct um, to look forward to and they give specific guidance uh, for cloud service providers on how to switch them uh, better and how also to get uh, access to your uh, data to port the data back to your own IT systems so it's not only switching providers. Thank you. Thank you. So we already learned something. Um, it's that there's a kind of two portability regimes, um, personal data and non-personal data. Uh, is it that Facebook perhaps is concentrated more on the personal data portability? Definitely, yes. As you may know, the information that is uh, obtained through the platform directly will qualify, I think, with no doubt and no legal discussion as uh, personal data. So the starting point for a company like this one, of course, is a portability right focus on the fact that the information that could be ported is considered personal data. But it is also true that when you think about the goals of this kind of um, regulation, you need to make compatible, not necessarily coincident, but compatible, I think the two main tensions that you have in the portability right, which is the competition, and therefore there will be a tension to maximize the sharing, and the data protection view, what will be just the opposite tension to minimize the data sharing. And for this to work, one of the possibilities, of course, is to try to have non-personal data, so that these personal data that are at the origin could be uh, suffer, uh, not in the bad sense, but that they, they, they go through a process of anonymization in order that the sharing may uh, be in, in the side of the non-personal uh, data sharing. And for doing this, uh, I think we are not the only industry who is struggling with the concept of anonymization. So this is not something that should only a company like Facebook be caring, but everybody. And when I have been uh, hearing or listening to the question with respect to the clinical trial data that seems not to be covered on the privacy shield. It was just because it was inherited from Safe Harbor. And the Safe Harbor, Sodomino's data were considered non-personal data. So the fact that we do not even have the same kind of approach internationally with respect to what personal data is, and also with respect to which kind of safeguards would permit us to have a relative concept of anonymization, this is something I think uh, every sector should be actually joining forces in order to think how we may uh, make compatible the two tensions. The fact that we have a tool which is a magnificent tool, I think, for innovation and competition, and also not forgetting that this is something that is coming from a data protection uh, perspective, and therefore that we need also to ensure that we have the appropriate safeguards. Uh, we have seen uh, certain limited guidelines on the matter, which are not specific with respect to the practicalities. Uh, so we have the Article 29 at that time, uh, working party uh, talking about portability when the GDPR was about to, to enter into force, but not yet. We also have uh, a report of uh, the UK DCMS on competition. And here you always see this, those who are experts in competition law they think that privacy is less complex as it is. And therefore, the report says, we should do portability of everything, but with robust safeguards. And you say, great, which are these robust safeguards? So what are you talking about with respect to privacy? And on the other side, when you look at the privacy experts, they are normally not an expert, of course, on antitrust point of view. And therefore, they also miss uh, that the two regulations are not having the same goals. They do not have the same patterns from a legal point of view. And this makes the discussion difficult, but interesting, definitely. And this has been one of the goals of Facebook, to raise the questions. We are not here only uh, to have the, the source of truth. We are not the only database of the world, even if people think that, of course, it is wide uh, enough, the kind of information that, that this company has. But there are databases that are interesting for innovation in the car sector, in the banking sector, of course, in the social networking sector, 
uh, I would not say with respect to the pharma sector that in addition is, is used for the good and the, and the scientific research. So I think it's in the interest of everybody that we address, all of us, these kind of questions. And if uh, I you, may, you, before yeah. I finish, just the five questions and then you can... Uh, yeah, the, the, this clock is kind of vicious. It jumped to 12 minutes now. Five <laughs> so the white paper that we have um, written and it is public and actually available here, Uh, is addressing five kinds of questions. The scope of the data portability, which doesn't seem to be that easy to answer. Uh, which data should be ported or should be portable? Whose data should be portable? And this is something that in a social network you may imagine in the picture that you have your aunt and your friends as to whether these other individuals should have a say or not in the porting decision. How we should protect privacy when enabling portability and after transfer, who is responsible? And this kind of question is very relevant. And for a company with Cambridge Analytica case, this definitely is a very good question to be posed and answered. It's always nice to have participants on a panel who anticipate the next question. My question would have, uh, would have concentrated on the scope of portability because I, I don't have the feeling that we have a common notion of what is comprised by data portability. Um, Do you have the feeling that the scope is cleared, or is it um, that we have a clear scope? Or I mean, uh, we all know. First of all, it's a new rule. I mean, this was not something which was uh, this this right or obligation as well, depending on from which side you're looking at it. Uh, was not yet in the previous data protection directive. Um, as it was mentioned, we do have the guidance of, uh, of the Article uh, 29 working party, which was then adopted by the European Data Protection Board. It does give practical examples also what should be included, what should not be included. Um, nevertheless, I think it's uh, valid questions uh, which, which can be raised. I think the key instrument to make it workable to see data portability in practice is to really bring the stakeholders uh, and in particular also, of course, uh, the data protection authorities uh, together and to discuss it and, and make it practical, uh, develop tools how the data subject can have access easily, can receive the data they provided previously. So m make it practical on the ground. And I do believe here uh, further uh, discussions uh, can, of course, uh, go on. We can talk about uh, operability, interoperability, standards. So what are the right tools, what is still needed on the market so that actually the users, the data subjects, and then also businesses can profit from it. It is a question of offer and demand. Um, is there a already demand by data subjects, by consumers? How many uh, requests on data portability did you receive at Facebook? We do have a lot, and the, the reason is that this company has invested in portability before GDPR. And therefore, we, we can have a better test probably than those who only have the one year, let's say, uh, portability since the GDPR has been um, implemented or has entered into force and hopefully implemented in the organizations. So Facebook uh, built the first portability tool in 2010. And it is named Download Your Information. It's, of course, like a kind, I think, an access rise 2.0, which is the beginning. It's like this Google Takeout thing in a way. Sorry? Is, is it like Google Takeout where you can download your data set? To a certain extent, yes, because the concept is, is I think, similar in the sense that you can have access to uh, your information in a broad sense and not necessarily align with the restrictions and then the Article 29 working party uh, included. But there is always a question as to whether, for example, if we think about the Article 29 working party was saying, The GDPR is saying the data that is provided by you as a user, and then there is the data that are observed actively by the organization, and then there is the data that could be inferred from the information that you are gathering. And the bar was put by the Article 29 Working Party in observed. So we have the provided and the observed, which is not in the text of the law, it's a construction. And that's why it's so important that DPAs, as Boyana was saying before, are forward-looking when they are construed, because the law is not, is not saying observed. We, we go through this. So observed would mean that, are you interested as an individual to get all the clicks that you have made in your 
browsing exercise? Maybe the response is yes, but we need to think when you are putting the burden on companies to keep this information and to put them accessible through technical means in order that this is something that could be ported as to whether all the cost that this will entail and the complexity from a technical viewpoint that you keep all the log click things that you have done, whether this is something that will at the end benefit what we want to benefit, that is the control from the user and the innovation. And maybe the response is yes, or maybe the response is yes, as a lawyer would say, depend. It depends. So that the context will be relevant in order to assess this. And maybe we will not have the same response if I will put this to a dating service as opposed to I will be putting this to an album picture service. I don't know. But the, the, the level of how this data will be used afterwards and by whom, maybe this will have an impact on the scope of the data that will be ported. So you say that Facebook have, has taken action uh, for quite a long time, and uh, but are you somewhat alone with it? Is, is there any company represented here in the audience that has taken serious arrangements for data portability? One company, two companies, okay. Yeah, that's, and uh, is this a question of offer and demand? Did you receive requests by users concerning Article 20 GDPR? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um. If I may, I may take. Uh, I will share my experience before Facebook because I have only sh uh, joined Facebook six months ago, so my experience is quite limited in, in, in this respect. But in other companies in which privacy was definitely taken into account very seriously, when I was in charge of the implementation of the GDPR program. And when we come to the work stream of data protection rights, uh, we made a survey among all of our jurisdictions and we, are, we were present in, in more than 200 countries. In order to know the volume, because the volume is relevant in order to know how you are going to invest in a certain technology in order to solve a certain number of problems. And in many countries, for the right of access, that was the, the best precedent that we may take for portability predictions, uh, there were zero requests. Any of us, uh, they have five. They say five per month, and they say no, five per year. Or they say, oh, if it is five per year, and I have all of these work streams for my GDPR program, maybe I will not put all my efforts in this work stream in particular because I need to prioritize the money and efforts of the organization with respect to other work streams that seems to be more urgent in the way in which we need to address them. So I think that this experience that I have probably is more universal maybe than I think, because the effort of GDPR has been extremely important, and maybe we have not yet seen, with respect to what we had, which is our starting point, that there was a, a, a hunger uh, of data portability at that time. So, I think that this yeah. will be changing, probably. So, so what, what has to happen? Uh, is this Article 20 to be redesigned? Has something to be added that data portability works? I mean, uh, the article applies only for a year. I mean, it's or a, a bit more than a year. So uh, I, I would definitely have to say that uh, that to speak about redesigning an article which is so new, uh, I, I, I doubt the, the, the benefits of that. Uh, I would rather focus on the actual ap application and implementation. And here, this is, uh, do, the, do the users even know they have the right? Uh, such a conference as this is a perfect example to actually promote what are your new rights or also obligation stemming from the GDPR. Because uh, it's true that certain principles are rather the focus on of the businesses first. Nevertheless, to actually be able to benefit that you see uh, any impacts on the market out of the data portability rights, it needs to be applied first, and of course you have to talk about what are what are the actual. How do you implement it? How is it practical? I mean, d does the data subject actually understand how how what kind of data it gets? How does it get it? How can it use it? The, uh, does other businesses understand the potential for new business model for innovations? So, working on that information, uh, I think this is definitely a step to make it applicable. 
Do you think that industry um, sees uh, portability, data mobility more as a threat for business models for their kept data, or does anyone see chances already? I mean, I, I do hope so. I mean, for the non-personal data part, definitely it was it was seen as an obstacle, uh, and uh, it it is an obstacle for uh, for data mobility. This is what we want. I mean, we have. In the GDPR, we have in the free flow of non-personal data, the principle of free movement of data. We do believe that this benefits the data economy. And so it's a cornerstone, I would say, for what Europe is standing for. So if you cannot move your data, if you do not, if you cannot take it back to your own devices or move to another provider, I do see it as an obstacle. And uh, I think this is something why we have to work on it. And uh, also on the code of conduct for uh, switching cloud providers and porting your data. While it's stemming from the non-personal data regulation, personal data, of course, can be addressed in this process of switching. And then, of course, the GDPR rules need to, need to be applied. But it's, uh, it's, it's something we really have to work on. The, the former German Minister of Justice and Consumer Protection, uh, Ms. Bali, she said, we need uh, another component. We do not only need portability, we do need interoperability, because that makes more, um, creates more use, ca user scenarios for the users, because then they have the um, expectation, I can do something with my data at provider B, if, if, if I got it from provider A. I think Do you think this users, is part of the solution? Absolutely. I think for the users and, of course, for other providers. I mean, to have to have an interest in in actually the data. So for for interoperability, for I mean, I mean, having data portability and in facilitating data portability. Uh, also, uh, you have to think about when you make any rules on that. How is this interoperable? How can it work in practice? So increasing interoperability, setting standards. Uh, it's it's a clear step forward. To to make these rules actually be applicable. Cecilia, would we be happy if the Facebook Messenger gets more compatible to Threema or what else there's on the market? Actually, this is also something that Facebook has already done. So there have been three kind of portability scenarios that at least the company has been analyzing. One would be the more pure GDPR one in which there is no relationship between uh, the transferring entity being, in this case, uh, uh, the role of Facebook and the recipient entity in which the user decides that I want this data and then uh, sends this to a company that or an organization or a public uh, body that is unrelated, let's say, to Facebook. This is one scenario. Another scenario is that when you see that this is not necessarily uh, permitting the kind of innovation that uh, all the society is expecting from, from the, the actors, you need to have this interoperability. And for this, you cannot be without any relationship with the recipient party, because otherwise interoperability will not work. And this is the purpose of what is called the data transfer project that has been initiated by a certain number of companies and first focusing on images, on pictures in order that it is easy for the users to, to, to port their information from one service to another in, in, instead of trying to download the thing and then send it, and since it is not interoperable, then you have a barrier there in order for the new service actually to, to work. And this is something that we have already been investing money and resources and, 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 and efforts for a certain number of years. So this is not new. The only thing is that it is difficult, but the standardization that will lead to the uh, interoperability is key in order that portability is not an unfulfilled promise, let's say, of the GDPR. And we have the third scenario in which you have even, so in the second one, you have a relationship with the recipients, but only for the sake of transferring the data, of having the portability uh, uh, happening. In the third scenario, you may have a closer relationship with the third party, that is the recipient. This is the model that uh, at Facebook has with respect to the platform. So if you are a Facebook user or you were, um, you will uh, probably be uh, popped out with um, offers of other services, apps that maybe, uh, I don't know, to which celebrity do you look like more, for example. 
In order for this to happen, of course, they need to have, for example, your picture in order to actually make this comparison. So there is a portability of your data that are relevant for a service that you would like and you choose actively to say, I want to know how this works. And therefore, this portability entails that there is a closer relationship from a technical and from a contractual viewpoint as well between the app developer in this case that is proposing this new service and the platform that could be serving the data as long as the user would like to go through this route and this is the service they would like to know and how we inform the kind of data that uh, are going to be ported and other kind of due diligence that we have undertaken after Cambridge Analytica. And this is a very, I would not say a very different scenario, but it has features that makes more questions that are posed with respect to the liability of the transfer entity and the recipient and also on the requesting user as well. Okay, I would have one last question, but as time runs out, perhaps there's a question from the audience. Okay, everything is portable now. Uh, I'm not sure whether I understood uh, your <laughs> your answer, um, and uh, I would really uh, know whether DG Connect uh, is committed to, to, um, to go as far into interoperability as to say that there will be real-time exchange of phone numbers, for instance, between WhatsApp and its competitors, so that you can directly call from one app to the other. Um, would that be part of your understanding of interoperability? And for WhatsApp, um, I didn't quite get um, the point. Are you are you willing to actually to to work into this direction of interoperability, or is it like you have to be forced into it? Who wants to start? Um, interoperability. So what you are describing now as a as a as an obligation. Uh, of interoperability that actually you can use uh, uh, services across systems. This is definitely not part of data portability rules as we see them now. That, yes, but this, uh, I mean, f let's first apply the data portability rule and imp really implement them on the market. That, that, that would be my interoperabilities across the system, so with, with the services. Um, I think we are quite far away from uh, the technical solutions on that, or even if you want to, to open the services across like this. But this is not my understanding of the current rules of data portability. With respect to the answer of the question whether we will be acting when we were forced to, as I explained, we have already did this. So we have not been waiting for others to force us. We have raised not only the conversation, but we have been actively working with other companies. First, because we cannot be speaking with all the companies in the world or all the public organizations, but definitely first. With respect to the download your information tool, this is something on which we have been not using a PDF, not using an Excel, as many companies have been doing for portability purposes. We have been doing another kind of format that is actually widely used and that permits this interoperability, at least in, I would say, the portability 2.0. If we are thinking of portability 3.0, we need to go further because we, in order that the data could be ported easily, the system should be able to talk uh, among each other. And this is the, pro the, the purpose of the data uh, transfer project in which we have started there for a certain number of years already. And the fact that we are bringing to the table the white uh, portability paper is not only words, it's actions that we want to take because otherwise we will not be investing this time in order to talk about portability and in order to see how complex it is and our willingness actually that this is something that is made true. We are in favor as I think everybody could at least recognize in favor of innovation but a responsible innovation and for this this kind of question should be posed. So. The curtain closes more than some questions still open. That's how it should be. Thank you, Marie-Therese. Thank you, Cecilia. Have a nice break, everybody.